So my disclosure is relevant disclosure. I have an augmented reality startup. I'll show some of the research data from that. Uh, so a little bit of history, brief background. Uh, what you're looking at is the virtual uh, retinal display, and there's a Chicago or Seattle connection here. This was developed at the uh, HIT lab at the University of Washington back in 1991. So there's a lot of buzz certainly around augmented reality uh, now. Uh, but this technology has been around for uh, decades, and people have been working on it for you know, 30, 40 years. So there's uh, really nothing uh, new under the sun. Quickly, a definition. So what, for those of you that don't know, what is augmented reality? It's essentially a technology that superimposes a computer-generated image onto a user's view of the real world. So there's a composite image uh, that's the end result. And like all good things in life, this originated with the military. So uh, the limitations of current navigation systems. So the purpose of uh, why we're discussing this. Uh, well, currently, there's no way to visualize anatomical structures simply by walking up to the patient and looking down at them. Uh, there are complex and unnatural hand-eye coordination that's required uh, when you're looking at between the screen and the, and the operative field. Uh, all of that adds up to a disruptive surgical workflow. And we've seen studies that show that uh, that not only adds to the complication rate, but also fatigues the surgeon. So the current systems rely on two-dimensional images uh, to uh, describe three uh, D anatomical structures. And we've talked about the 80%, 10% rule. Is that right? 80-10, 10% rule. Uh, and uh, they're not as intuitive or ergonomic. So here's an example of what I mean by that. So that's a limitation. You know, you can see the surgeon looking at the screen far away from the operative field and certainly not looking at his hand. So he has to go up and down between the screen and the, and the surgical field. So what is an ideal system? What, 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 is it, what are the major points of such a thing? Well, it's real time, so there's no lag. Uh, it's accurate. It allows for 3D overlay of relevant anatomical structures. It's comfortable and it's valuable. By valuable, I don't mean financially valuable, but actually provides you with the information that you want. It decreases patient morbidity and improves outcomes. So hopefully this all ends up uh, resulting in significant increase in surgeon confidence, uh, surgical accuracy and precision. The way I like to th think about it is somebody handed you a sawbones model, uh, you could teach uh, a 10 year old how to put a pedicle screw within three minutes with good accuracy. So having all that information is very important. And significant decrease in implant placement time and uh, hopefully uh, the, health, the amount of healthy t tissue being removed. So, what are the currently available solutions? Once you mention augmented reality to an audience, people automatically think of the Google Glass. And Google Glass did a very good job of popularizing uh, the concept of augmented reality. Essentially, it was a, a small computer attached to a glasses frame uh, along with a projector and a prism and a battery. The problem is that you don't really don't see that much. So you see that top right picture. And what you see is a, a fairly low resolution image in a very small field of view. Uh, fortunately, that has not stopped people from using it in spine surgery. Uh, and uh, Yoon et al. Uh, looked at the technical feasibility and safety of an intraoperative head-up display, uh, as also known as the Google Glass, during spine instrumentation. So what they did is they took the nerve navigation imaging, they uploaded it into that small computer in the Google Glass uh, headset, and then they uh, performed pedicle screw instrumentation of approximately 40 screws. Uh, their operative time was about the same with and without the device. Uh, they gave a survey at the end to the surgeons, and overall, 80% uh, had a fairly uh, positive uh, response to that. However, they noticed the, the uh, significant uh, disadvantages, such as the small display and the low processing speed. And this is a picture from the paper, and if you, I don't know if you can see, but if you focus on the surgeon's eyes, it does not look like he's looking at the operative field, right? He looks like he's thinking very hard and trying to see what's on that Google Glass image. It actually looks like he's in pain when he's doing that. Uh, and that certainly is one of, the, one of the limitations. So just to sum up the limitations of this approach, it's not three-dimensional. There's no image overlay. There's no head tracking. Uh, and the image is closer than the working area. So once again, you're not looking at the operative field. And it has a very small field of view. So the next application is a projection technique. So literally, a projector is used to uh, display uh, the image onto the patient. And here's an example of that for a, a neurosurgery case where they're trying to uh, localize the lesion. Uh, and uh, what you see here is the intraoperative view with the red spot uh, demonstrating uh, the lesion. And here they actually uh, have a retractor. And I don't think that kind of comes out poorly. But you see the red area. That's the region of interest. So. 
the problems with this, these are once again, two dimensional images. So there's no depth perception because there's no 3D. There's no head tracking. What does that mean? The image does not adjust depends on, depending on your perspective. When you put a hand or an instrument in the way, it blocks the projected image. And the image does not bend uh, to adjust for curved surfaces. Okay, moving on to the next uh, uh, type of device. So this is uh, a busy slide that essentially shows a, a semi-transparent mirror and an LCD screen. And we sort of reproduced this and simplified it in the lab. And this is what it looks like. There's a monitor, a mirror, some kind of transducer for the navigation, and you see the spine. So I'll show a quick video. Yeah, so what we did is we took a Sawbones model, CT scanned it, reformatted the image, and then used the projector technique that you saw before to project it onto the glass. Uh, so you see that uh, the electromagnetic uh, navigation is, uh, is attached to that, and it gives you an overlay of the anatomy, uh, which is pretty close. Uh, it depends on, on mainly the EM tracking. And here's the Sawbones model. So uh, you can notice when you tilt the head, the image uh, correspondingly adjusts. Uh, based on your perspective, and that's what I meant by that head tracking. So uh, the prior system is fairly bulky, so you can't really imagine putting this in the operating room with great practicality. So a head-mounted, sorry, a head-mounted display uh, was uh, attempted by these authors, and uh, this essentially uh, consisted of uh, slide missing. Okay. Uh, of a head uh, camera, optical tracker, and um, and the, the structure being tracked, this slide shows you all the complex interactions that occur if you get a bunch of pieces involved. So if you have something on your head, there's a localizer in the spine, there's a computer, there's a tracker, each one of these systems can generate a potential error. If you sum up the errors, the device may be unacceptably inaccurate. So the more components, the more complexity, the more room for error. In addition, significant weight, about eight pounds for this, uh, for this study. Uh, there was a lag effect, it was nauseating, the focal length was not ideal. So a, a lot of reasons why it probably will not uh, see the light of day soon. Uh, this is uh, something that's uh, been fairly popular, uh, a tablet-based approach. You hold up a tablet, it uh, projects some anatomical structures directly onto it. Uh, however, once again, this is not a three-dimensional uh, object. There's no head tracking. The eyes focus on the iPad, not on the field, and you can't really manipulate the instruments. So another great uh, Seattle-based company, this is from Microsoft. Uh, the introduction of the HoloLens uh, has gotten people talking uh, generally about augmented reality again uh, after the Google Glass failure. And uh, you know a lot of people have started using this. Uh, it's fairly easy to use. And this is uh, from Duke University Department of Neurosurgery, where they did an extraventricular drain uh, placement simulation with the HoloLens. And the pluses of the HoloLens device, it is three-dimensional. Uh, there's excellent head, head tracking. So as you move around the object you're looking at, it sort of keeps the image uh, in its place. And this is once again from Duke right here. Uh, you can see that there's a projection of the anatomy onto the simulated uh, head. But as you can see, the accuracy is not that great. You're looking the yellow uh, piece is the actual drain, and the red one uh, is the is where the computer thinks the drain is. So. Uh, other uh, limitations of, of this approach are there's a limited processing power, so it's like a, a telephone attached to your head. There's poor accuracy, uh, questionable comfort for long hours. The field of view of this is not that great either, and it's a closed system architecture, meaning that you really cannot make modifications to, to improve its uh, efficiency. So this is something that, well, once again, we've been working on. Uh, and uh, you can see the orthogonal planes at the top of the screen. You can see the uh, spine in the middle. And then there's a virtual representation of the uh, tool. And what you're actually looking at is this uh, with, the, uh, with the image of the spine superimposed uh, uh, on uh, the, the Sawbones model. So that's a next, I guess, phase of what I've been showing before. And here's a video of that uh, playing out. And here are my kids. Thank you. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. <laughs>